Morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with another video. Um, this is actually a re-record because the um, first one, the audio wasn't good. Uh, but before we get started, I want to do just a little bit of housekeeping. So first, I'm starting a new mailing list. Um, I was on I was on uh, uh, Mailchimp, but it's too complicated for what I need. Um, so I'm moving over to this Google form. I've already got 48 responses. Um, so this is for people, primarily people who either want to invest in my startup um, and, or people who want to collaborate in some way or another. Um, and then also if you just want uh, generic news. Um, links in the description. Um, so that's that. The other thing is <clears throat> um, I did add ads. I, I posted a poll and more than 90% of people were okay with ads. That's perfectly fine. But I'm over... 5,000 subscribers now. So if the 10% of people who uh, w uh, were willing to support me on Patreon, that's five times what I have now. And if I if I 5x what I've got now, that puts me at 5,000 a month. And if I get to there, I will take down ads permanently because that's enough to support my life. Um, right now, the combination of ads and Patreon is enough to support me. But um, honestly, I see ads as a waste of time. I don't want to waste your time. I want to add value. So if we can get to that mark, uh, great. And I'm not going to do partnerships because I'm not going to I'm not going to waste your time by putting sponsor ads in my videos as well. I want to have as much value as possible with no distractions. Anyways, offer still on the table. If we can get to four or five thousand a month, I will take down ads permanently. Now on with the show. <clears throat> AI and you. Uh, this was a popular topic that has been requested in a bunch of different ways. Um, people want to know how AI is going to affect them, uh, their jobs, and that sort of thing. So here we go. How will tech like ChatGPT affect your life? Uh, there are a lot of people that are concerned about it, and for good reason. We will unpack all of those reasons, and we will look at data in the course of this video. Oh, by the way, it's long, which you probably noticed when you clicked on it with the, uh, the length and the chapters. All right, first... Let's set the stage. What is the context here? If you are new to the channel, which many of you are, um, you might you might have landed here and you don't know anything about AI um, or specifically this current wave of AI. So the, the, the current thing is the big breakthrough was called uh, an LLM or a large language model. It's basically autocorrect on steroids um, or another way I think of it is predictive text. Um, however, it is like mi literally millions of times more powerful than the predictive text on your phone, maybe billions of times. It's very, very powerful. Now, this concept might seem simple. You know, if all it does is predict the next word, okay, like how is that so powerful? I won't unpack all the reasons. I've got other videos talking about uh, this AI, but it is very powerful, especially if you can accurately predict the next word in any topic. And the, it, this, this, uh, this ability has implications in science, education, technology, law, medicine, basically everywhere. So that's the context. Now that we've got the stage set, why now? What's different and why is AI suddenly taking off so fast? Well, if you're new to LLMs, to GPT-3 and chat GPT, uh, it might surprise you to know that these technologies have been around for a few years. GPT-3, which this is based on, has been around for two years. So what changed? What's different? Uh, the primary thing that changed was the UI and the UX. Uh, so chat is a very, very intuitive and familiar interface. Chat has been around for many years, uh, decades even. Um, and uh, you know, everyone, especially people my age, uh, will remember things like IRC and AIM. Um, but all you young people in your TikToks these days, I don't know how that works. Um, anyways, point being, we're all familiar with text messages, emails, and chat uh, interfaces. And so when you have a powerful enough AI attached to a familiar interface, people just get it. So that's why, that's why it's exploding suddenly after this technology has been on the stage for two years. There is another component of that, and that is fine tuning. That is the reinforcement learning with human feedback that helped ChatGPT uh, produce such good answers. We're not going to dive into that. Maybe I can make another video. Oh, by the way, um, one of the best ways to, to, for me to find the content is y'all comment and vote and 
comment on each other's comments because that tells me what's resonating with you guys. So uh, if you, whatever you want a video on, comment in the videos, tell me and talk to each other too. <clears throat> okay, so why chat though? What is, what is, what's the underpinning thing? Like, okay, chat is familiar, but why? Why is it useful? So it's simple and intuitive. There's no bells and whistles and knobs and levers and complexity. You don't need any code. You have one place of interface. You have a chat window. You have a text box that you enter into. It's brain dead simple. You can't get it wrong. Um, it's also very flexible. So if you've used ChatGPT, you probably have noticed that like it can like role play. It can tell you about history. It can um, help you with coding, with writing, all kinds of stuff. So it's a simple formula that applies to a lot of stuff. So because it's so simple but flexible, it's kind of like a universal tool, an Omni tool or a Swiss Army knife, and we'll get we'll get into that mentality in just a minute. Uh, but for instance, this is why automatic cars are more popular than manual cars because they're easier to use. It's that simple. So low friction, high usability, high flexibility. This is a this is a uh, a pillar of design moving forward with AI. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, so all that being said, what are its limitations? So give me a second, I need some tea. So the first limitation is that ChatGPT and similar technologies are not autonomous. This is, there's two reasons for this. One, it's by design for safety. And two, uh, we haven't done quite enough work on cognitive architectures. That's one of the things that I study and research and test. Um, if you're familiar with my older work on this channel and my books. So it's not autonomous. That means that humans are still in the driver's seat. We've got our hands on the wheels. We've got our, our feet on the pedals. Um, so we're still in control. It just sits there and waits. Uh, to a, a greater or lesser degree, you also have to know what you're doing since you're steering. Excuse me. Um, and because of that, interacting with these models is a new skill. It's an entirely new skill set. I would not be surprised if within the month you see people saying like, we want to have people, you know, on, on your resume or, you know, on a job description, that you know how to interact with language models. So, and any, anytime there's a new skill, there's a new learning curve. So uh, another aspect of that, you know, it's not autonomous is the brain in a jar model. <clears throat> uh, Chat GPT is not connected to the outside world at all. Rumor has it with uh, their announcement of the chat GPT professional, um, they're gonna change that. They're gonna allow for some kind of integration to something. Um, the most obvious thing seems, seems to be the internet. And there's been plenty of people out there on YouTube doing experiments of connecting chat GPT to the internet and other stuff. That's honestly why I haven't done a video on it. I'm like, oh, someone already did that. You don't, I don't need to duplicate this effort. Um, so integrations are coming. All kinds of people are working on it. It would be silly if OpenAI wasn't. Uh, but for right now, it's a brain in a jar, which means it's kind of just locked in its own head. Um, it also can't do everything. There's lots of gotchas and gaps and you know and things that it can't do well. Um, again, lots of people studying that. Uh, doing the, there's lots of people tweeting about it, other videos. So I'm not going to cover that in depth. But suffice to say, ChatGPT can't do everything. It can do a lot though. <clears throat> So let's talk about what it can do. What is it really good at? Why is it so strong? Um, it's like a Swiss army knife of AI tools. It does a little bit of everything pretty good. Um, and when I say everything, I mean like almost everything. It does a lot of things that you and I can't do um, just by virtue of we're one person. Um, I had a recent interview with a professional prompt engineer, uh, Anna Bernstein, you should look up that video. Um, and one of the things that she said is that working with language models is like working with a toddler who knows everything. So the model knows just about everything, but it can only follow simple instructions. That's a very, very shorthand version of what she meant. Um, and I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but that's just like that, that th people have quoted that to me. They're like, oh man, like she, <laughs> anyways, I don't want to get lost in the weeds. That was, that was a quotable moment from the video. So for instance, it can help with coding writing, brainstorming, it can teach you just about anything, it can help you plan, it can help you overcome writer's block, right? And it's so simple that pretty much everyone can use it. And lastly, it's very cheap, right? It, ta it costs just a few cents, maybe a dollar an hour to use. And so one thing that I wanna point out is that, um, and we'll, we'll get into this uh, uh, later, 
Think about how much it would cost to pay an assistant to do the things that ChatGPT does for you, right? And that's where you see, oh, that's where the value is. It's way cheaper than a human and just as good as a team of 10 humans. <clears throat> All right, so now let's look at the data. We've set the stage. You understand what's going on and why it's valuable. So where is going from here? Now I need to warn you, we're going to go way back in history because we're going to establish long-term trends to understand and unpack what's happening, where are we, and where are we going. Okay, I promise we're going way back. We'll start at the first industrial revolution. Uh, so it basically started with the steam engine invented by this dude uh, named James Watt. James Watt? Something Watt. I think it was James Watt. Uh, the steam engine caused a huge shift towards urbanization uh, because suddenly there were these machines that, one, they weren't that portable at first. They had to be in giant factory floors, um, but you could hook up all kinds of fun stuff to it, like looms and mills and blah, 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 and you no longer were dependent upon water wheels. And so then you could have uh, a lot of power wherever you wanted it. And so the steam engine filled an energetic gap. And what I mean by that is that human bodies are not that good at doing labor. That's why we've used horses and ox and other beasts of burden. In India, they've used elephants for many years because they're larger and stronger. Uh, and that's why we have used uh, farm animals for, since forever to do stuff. And the steam engine takes that uh, and turns it up to 11 uh, because all you have to feed a steam engine is coal or wood and water. And suddenly it can do the work of many, many like rivers worth of water wheels or many horses or many ox worth of labor. Um, and it doesn't get sick and die. <laughs> uh, so the efficiency is there because of the amount of energy that it can put into things. Chat GPT doesn't put energy into things, it puts mental labor into things. But it's all different kinds of labor. So there's mechanical energy, there's mental energy, and so on. So just keep that in mind as we move up and forward into the future. So this started in the uh, 18th century, in the 1700s. <clears throat> okay, so fast forward 100 years, as the steam engine is uh, really ramping up, um, we are starting to get uh, mechanized agriculture, which leads to the agricultural revolution. So, uh, and then you combine that with crop science, uh, which really kind of started, um, who was it? The, like the, someone who's considered like the father of crop science, I think that was around 1920. Anyways, point being is uh, around 1840, 70% of Americans were farmers. So the mechanization of farming has completely destroyed this as a job sector. Now, less than 2% or around 2% of Americans are farmers. So farm jobs were destroyed, but of course everyone will say like, oh, but you know, technology disruptions create more jobs and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But point being is sometimes a technology shift does permanently destroy a sector, right? Keep that in mind is that mechanization pretty much permanently killed farming as a major sector of the economy. That being said, there are still farmers today, right? There's just a much fewer farmers overall as a percentage of the workforce. Okay, so then let's fast forward to, um, so this is, this is 1840 to, well, 2000, so almost present. So let's fast forward to here, the last uh, 80 years or so, the post-war boom. So what happened during World War II was a tremendous investment in science and technology. Not only that, um, women w uh, entered the workforce en masse because all the men were either sent to the front or were doing things that only men can do. And so women were brought into the workforce to do typing, to do uh, computing, to do uh, weapons assembly, uh, garment manufacturing, all kinds of stuff. And so one of the unintended consequences of World War II was First, the workforce changed drastically. Once women got into the workforce, they're like, we don't want to go back home. We want to stay in the workforce. We like having money and having our own determination. So that was a permanent societal shift. But then, because of the huge advance in science and technology, we had a huge boost to, uh, a huge shift, sorry, to a service-based economy or a knowledge-based economy. And that's what this graph shows. So we have non-farm employees, which is uh, like service sector, right? Or, or, um, or non-manufacturing, right? So manufacturing, services, farm, 
the a whole economy shifted. So if you remember this this one, farm jobs going down, service jobs and knowledge jobs going up. So that's been the last almost whole century now. Um, so we have a century of uh, the post-war boom because of uh, due in no small part due to mechanization, right? And then it, it only ramped up from there because here in 1959 and so on, this is when you start introducing computers, which leads to the information age. So remember how I showed you that uh, mechanization, the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, um, basically destroyed farming as a primary staple of the economy. Um, and But then what happens is you get new sectors. You get one sector that pretty much goes away like, um, uh, horse groomers, right, and horse drivers, that went away because of the Ford Model T and, and automobiles. Likewise, you get new things, right? So we replaced um, people who care for horses with auto mechanics and auto builders. Likewise, the introduction of computers led to the information age, which created an entirely new sector of IT and, and computer engineers. That's what I have done for the last 15 years of my career until I just retired because now I'm making enough money on uh, on ads and uh, Patreon. Um, and so, uh, again, like this is a, another perfect example. I couldn't have switched to this job before YouTube, right? Before the internet. And so technology will sometimes destroy sectors or greatly reduce them, but then it will also create entirely new categories. So the theory is, um, oops, sorry, premature. The theory is that uh, as uh, technology and science advance, yes, some categories will go away or be diminished, um, but new categories will be created, and those new categories will inevitably be larger than the previous ones. Now, I want to temper this by pointing out that in that same time period where we see farm jobs going the way of the dinosaurs and service jobs going up, population has also exploded. Right, So some of what you're seeing is a function of population growth. Um, some of it is also a function of, uh, of technology, of immigration, of science. But one thing to point out is that uh, population growth has been a huge driver of economic growth. More, more workers, more producers, and more consumers, economy grows. If the economy is flat or declines, in, in most nations where that has happened, the economy also stalls. Look at Italy, look at Japan, look at Greece, right? You look around the world to where the population has plateaued and has contracted, and so has their economy. So correlation does not equal causation, but it's a really compelling argument. So just keep all that in mind that all these growth narratives around, you know, science and technology only causes growth. I don't know that I fully agree with that. I think that population growth has been a primary driver of economic growth for the last few centuries, especially when you consider that uh, we hit our fastest period of population growth in like the 50s, um, and it started slowing down because we're reaching carrying capacity. Okay, but the conclusion that the economists want you to come to right now is that new technology always creates new jobs. Yes, it destroys some categories, but it creates new categories, and growth is infinite hypothetically. I beg to differ. So now we're going to pivot and talk about the evidence against this narrative that technology only creates new jobs. So first of all, we are here. <laughs> this is, this is, a, uh, um, this is uh, as we approach the carrying capacity of the planet, which is su suspected to be around 9 to 11 billion, maybe up to 13 billion with some more technological improvements, um, we are going to start uh, entering into a phase of what's called economic compaction. Now, this is a term that I have very rarely seen. It's kind of a very arcane term, and I couldn't even find uh, some something defining this again. But I do remember reading about it. And so economic compaction is basically there are more workers competing for fewer resources, including jobs, right? And we're also going to be approaching the thermodynamic limits of things like hydrological sites. There's only so much fresh water to go around. There's only so much light to go around. There's only so much arable land to go around. And as we expand as a species to maximum capacity of our environment, because we haven't gotten off Earth yet, and oh, by the way, there is, there is no other fertile soil in this entire solar system. So Earth is all we got. 
So we are, we are presently facing the early stages of economic compaction, which is basically, it's getting crowded. And we knew this, it, whether or not we would admit it to ourselves, when we watch movies like The Matrix and Blade Runner, um, where like we have these dystopian visions of the future where everyone is living on top of each other. And like we're afraid of that. Like we, Nobody wants to live like that, but we kind of intuitively know that's where we're heading. Um, and so, again... When you zoom out and look at the planet as a whole, I don't care about macroeconomic trends. Look at the total energy available to the human species. Look at the total amount of water and land available to the human species. That's what I see driving the trends right now. Now, if economic growth has been tightly correlated with population growth, then economic growth is probably about to taper off and plateau globally uh, within the next 10 to 20, 30, 50 years, who knows. Um, but pretty soon. <clears throat> okay, so if that previous narrative that new technology always creates new jobs and new categories, you would expect the total employment to continue going up through the end of the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st century. That's not true. That's not what happened. Labor force participation rate peaked in the year 2000. Let me say that again. The, 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 the period of time where we had the most participation in the, in, the, in the labor market in America was in the year 2000, right at the beginning of the dot-com revolution, right at the beginning of the, the technology, uh, the shift towards you know, you know, the singularity. So there's obviously, this is, this is, this is uh, there's lots of variables, lots of factors that go into this. And so I'm not saying that, that automation or technology alone is responsible for this. But if that previous narrative was true, that technology always creates new categories, which always results in growth, then you'd expect to not see a 23 year downward trend in labor force participation, because theoretically, the demand for jobs, the demand for workers would be so compelling that the salaries would be so good that people would be like, you know what, it's worth my time. But instead, we have the opposite trend. We have quiet quitting. We have the great resignation, which I'm now a part of because I was like, you know what? My day job isn't worth it. I'm going to go make YouTube videos instead. <laughs> That's the first time I said that out loud and wow. <laughs> Anyways, so point being, a lot of us are checking out of the, uh, out of the conventional economy because we're just like, nah, it's not worth it. Um, if... You know, if if my salary had gone up, like in in lockstep with the value that I was adding, my day job should have paid me like two hundred thousand a year, but it didn't, right? Um, like I'm a freaking expert, and I'm like I can go make more money on YouTube. What am I dealing? Why why am I dealing with you bozos? Anyway, sorry, I'm getting lost in the weeds. Point being is it's not working. That the the theory that uh, uh, technology and science creates new jobs and new categories. We have a 23-year trend saying the opposite. Now, let's look at some more data. Um, so I need to inform you of two categories. Uh, one is neat and the other is NILF. Um, and no, get your mind out of the gutter. I am a NILF. I, that means not in labor force. Um, although, since I'm starting a startup, maybe I am in the labor force. I'm just, I don't know. Uh, anyways, point being, uh, neat means not seeking education, employment, or training. So a neat is someone who, um, who has just never, like, I think it's typically young people, but these are people that are just never, ever going to even enter the workforce in the first place. And then a NILF is someone who has checked out for whatever reason, um, whether it's a disability or a voluntary choice or freelancing or whatever. Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know if freelancing is is counted in, in that. So maybe maybe I'm not an elf. Sorry. Um, long story short, people are checking out of work, and so let's let's just unpack this graph real quick because this is small. So this is the same data we saw a minute ago, which is the um, the labor force participation rate. And so you see it followed this big hump, peaked around 2000, and it's been downhill ever since. And then this blue line is the uh, is the ratio of not in labor force. Um, so we have today, it looks like we're uh, approaching 96 million people um, in America that are not in the labor force. And this trend is not slowing down. So again, that narrative 
that the information age is going to revolutionize everything doesn't seem like it's happening. So the new conclusion that I've come to based on a 23 year trend is the information age is not producing more jobs or abundance of demand for workers. Certainly not enough demand to have salaries rise in a, in a fashion that would be compelling enough to reverse the trend of people checking out permanently. Well, I don't know if it's permanent, but people checking out seemingly permanently. Obviously, like if you go for 23 years without a job, like you got something else going on. So let's talk about who's at risk. If it, I hope this provides a compelling enough uh, argument that like, okay, that old narrative isn't holding up. So who's at risk? According to this Zipia uh, uh, link, which has a lot more graphs, um, we've got 25% of the population is at high potential uh, for being automated away. And another 35%, almost 36%, is at medium potential. So that means the vast majority of workers today are at medium or high risk for being automated out of their jobs. It's happening. Um, so like you might, the, the first thing is like, okay, how do I protect myself from that? Um, they, the, there's a few things that can protect people. So one, manual labor does take a little bit longer to automate. And the reason is because robots are not yet what's called compliant. So a compliant robot here, actually, let me make sure that, okay, yes, we're recording correctly. Okay. Uh, so a compliant robot is something that if you push on it, it can kind of adapt to dynamic por uh, forces and pressures. The leading company um, uh, building uh, compliant robots, can you guess who it is? It's actually Disney. Because Disney has led animatronics for many, many years. And so ironically enough, Disney might make the first fully compliant robot that's able to like do dishes with you in your kitchen. Um, who knows? We'll see. Um, but human touch and emotional intelligence are critical and those might never be replaced. Um, so uh, like for instance, um, human touch is, is not just um, physical touch. It can be, you know, caregiving for, uh, for, for children, um, but also uh, voice and emotional intelligence and communication. Uh, so things like managers uh, and, and therapists and uh, massage uh, specialists, um, physical therapists, doctors, nurses, a lot of jobs will be insulated against um, ro uh, robotic automation. Uh, some of them indefinitely. Some jobs are just permanently and intrinsically better done by humans. Now, if you work in front of a computer, your job is in danger of being automated. Like simple rule of thumb, if you work in front of a computer, you can be automated away. And I'm saying this as a, as a YouTube creator. It's not going to be long until someone can just use an algorithm to synthesize voice, face, uh, automatically come up with the slides that I'm doing and all, all kinds of stuff. Like if, it's, if your product is video or text or email or audio, like you're in danger of being automated away. Um, now, that being said, those that can create and use AI tools are going to be the safest among knowledge workers, which is one reason that I have pivoted my career away from IT infrastructure and into AI. I was like, you know what? AI is the next big thing, so I'm going to become an expert on that. Okay, enough said. So automation has already destroyed jobs. There was a graph that I, that I was trying to find that it was like, you know, it was like um, automation has created 58 million jobs in the last 10 years. It's also destroyed 75 million jobs. So we have a net loss of 15 million jobs or something like that. Um, but I couldn't find that graph, but I did find one that shows that we're gonna lose 73 million more jobs by 2030. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, what happens when 73 million more, <clears throat> more people lose their jobs and that trend of people checking out of the workforce seemingly for good continues and ramps up? Uh, are we gonna end up with a labor participation rate of less than 50%? What are the rest of us going to do? How are we going to make ends meet? We'll get to that. The, the, the most salient question after all this is why not hire humans? If technology increases efficiency, why not hire more humans? The reason is because machines are often cheaper, faster, and better than humans. Um, they don't require insurance, no HR, they don't form unions. Uh, so essentially machines are the perfect employee. If they break, you just fix it. They only run on um, programming and power. 
excuse me. Uh, so because of that, humans are just expensive to employ. Sorry, I need some tea. Humans are expensive. That's all it comes down to. Machines are cheaper. Um, ChatGPT costs a few dollars per hour and can replace all kinds of uh, human labor already. Just, just think about how much help ChatGPT can give you. It's basically an executive assistant and a sidekick uh, all rolled up into one and it knows everything. So it's like, how many people would you have, how big of a team would you have to have to replace that labor and how expensive would it be? So, and this is only version one of ChatGPT folks. Think of how much powerful this is gonna be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. One thing to keep in mind, and we're about to pivot this video in a big way, capitalism is the quest for maximum efficiencies and humans are not that efficient. That's why we moved to the steam engine. That's why we built computers. That's why we built tractors. That's why we build machines in the first place. That's why we build tools. And that's why they are valuable despite how expensive they are and how difficult they are to build. Even as complex as a computer is, the value added is so compelling and the efficiency is so compelling that it's easier and cheaper in the long run to use a machine than it is to use a human. This principle is only going to accelerate. Okay, that's a lot of doom and gloom. So what's next? What do we do? Like, are we all screwed? Is there hope? Um, and it seems like there's a big paradox, right? If efficiency keeps going up, and I should have had a chart for that um, in terms of like productivity per per labor hour, I think the I think on average the the average laborer is like eighty percent more per, or eighty times more productive than they were a century ago. If we are eighty times more productive than we were a century ago, where is all that going? Where is all that value that we're creating? Where is it going? Um, and what can we do about it? Will this trend ever reverse? So to answer that question, we have to take a little detour into philosophy and ethics and religion uh, and, and, and economics, but I digress, I repeat myself. Um, so John Maynard Keynes, who is the father of macroeconomics, said in the 1920s or 30s that we would be, we should be working around 10 to 14 hours per week by now. Uh, we're not. In fact, we're working more. Well, no, I think, I think, uh, total, total labor hours peaked in the seventies or eighties. Um, but we're still working a lot more than we should be. Uh, and so where did this come from? So this would take a really long time to unpack. So I'll just recommend the book, do nothing, um, which is very, very well cited. Um, and it talks very extensively about the political, social, economic, and religious uh, reasons behind our cultural workaholism. As a culture, we use fear, guilt, and shame to keep people working. Um, and we also uh, use fear, guilt, and shame um, around laziness or idleness, which means that it has been the established policy uh, of, of state and federal governments that people ought to be working. And we ought to incentivize that behavior, which means that um, the, the, that mentality trickles down and it is implicitly embedded in all of our legislation, all of our fiscal policy, all of our monetary policy, and then it also gets embedded in the zeitgeist of our culture where we have uh, you know, the hustle culture. That is one of, the, one of the primary ways that you see it today is like, if you're not working two or three jobs, you're falling behind. That is people that have internalized capitalism. Um, and then you end up with, whenever anyone pushes back, you say, well, who, who are you to declare what's good or bad? Why, why do you get to say that this is not good or bad? Society has decided that laziness is bad. So what we need instead, instead of this hyper-competitive mentality, is we need a post-scarcity and hyper-abundance mentality, which is a completely different mentality from laziness is a sin to you must be working or otherwise you're going to be uh, condemned, right? So post-scarcity is a hypothetical state where the scarcity of all basic goods and services uh, practically no longer exists. Um, and hyperabundance is another way. It's uh, two sides of the same coin. So hyperabundance is just another way of thinking about post-scarcity. Air and sunlight are hyperabundant resources. Air is so abundant that you never have to pay for it 
All you have to do is regulate it so to keep it clean enough so that everyone can use it. Sunlight is also hyperabundant because again, you don't need to pay for it unless you're like at the North Pole where you have like perpe perpetual night for three months. Um, so with massive increases in human efficiency, why don't we have a post-scarcity and hyperabundant mentality? Um, so one, or I guess I, I, I phrased that wrong. We don't redistribute the benefits of, of our efficiency because we don't have those mentalities. We'll get into how do we adopt those mentalities soon. But it all basically comes down to beliefs. Economists have certain beliefs. Politicians have certain beliefs. Uh, the, the, the philosophical zeitgeist of the time gives us certain beliefs. But beliefs are, they're often anchored in some evidence, uh, but beliefs are also often arbitrary, which is why I picked this graphic is just because it's like you, you pray at the altar of neoliberalism or you pray at the shrine of, of capitalism and corporatism or whatever, like whatever your preferred uh, philosophy is. Um, so how does that physically manifest? Right. Okay. I can talk about, you know, zeitgeist and philosophy and beliefs and however I want, but the, 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 the bottom line is in after, after the, after world war two, which, so the, the marginal tax rates were really high to pay off the war debt. So it makes sense that after the war debt is paid off, tax rates go down a little bit, but then they just kept cratering. So what happened? Well, around 1980, Neoliberalism became the de facto uh, policy globally, and that was uh, pushed by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, which, you know, two of the most powerful economies in the world. We set the tone for everyone else. It was also adopted by the IMF and the World Bank. So with the rise of neoliberalism, the belief was um, you, you deregulate, you privatize, you give people individual liberty, so that they can do whatever they want with their money and the government should do less. Now, there were some really compelling reasons for the adoption of neoliberalism because what was working, what we had before then was working even worse in some respects. Um, there's a book called A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey. Definitely recommend it because it does get neoliberalism a fair shake, but it also points out its flaws in reasoning and logic and also just where it completely goes off the rails. Point being is, Neoliberalism is the reason that we are is one of the reasons we're experiencing what we are experiencing today. Uh, population growth and globalism are also reasons, and there is a huge backlash against globalism right now, which is very interesting to watch it play out. Um, but tax rates are just one way that you can tell that uh, we have this this different mentality that goes away from uh, or that it, that is further from post scarcity and hyperabundance, and that is I got mine. Screw you. Okay, so what drives all this? I'm glad you asked. Nihilism. Nihilism is the underpinning philosophy behind all of this. Neoliberalism is an, is, is an intrinsically nihilistic philosophy. Um, it's also a dystopian philosophy. So in the uh, 19th century, uh, in Russia, of course Russia, um, the nihilists said nothing matters. And they were basically anarchists. They wanted to burn everything down and start over. The idea spread westward, um, and it really caught on. You might have heard about this dude named uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, so he wrote extensively about nihilism and the will to power and uh, basically invented rugged individualism and a whole bunch of toxic stuff all in one go. Um, so as we were challenging our beliefs around religion, spirituality, philosophy, Nihilism takes over because it's like, ugh, we can't figure out anything, so just nothing matters. There's no physical evidence that, that God exists, that anyone cares about us, nothing matters. And the capitalist step, stepped in and said, well, my profits matter. And so then everyone else was like, all right, sure, fine, profits matter. Uh, and then now as a, as a planet, we optimize for GDP. Does that sound like how we want to live? Like the, 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 the single number that everyone spends all kinds of time focusing on is GDP, gross domestic product, pro product, right? So we've optimized for GDP. We're not optimizing for life. We're not optimizing for humanity. We're not optimizing for anything else other than profit. So a century later, how do we feel about that? Did it work? We're more productive than ever, but are we happier than ever? 
all metrics indicate that um, happiness is cratered, that we are the like in one of the most unhappy times in recorded history. Um, and the reason is because we have this undercurrent of nihilism that says, you don't matter, I don't matter. And then someone else comes in and fills in a narrative that says, well, profits matter. We saw this in memes at the beginning of the pandemic where everyone was panicking. They're like, but the economy. And everyone's like, I don't care about your economy, dude. Like, I'm going to go die. Like, don't tell me to reopen the economy. And so that's when the, uh, the, the cartoonishness of the Ferengi from Star Trek kind of became a little too real. Uh, and that's why I picked, uh, picked Quark here to represent this because the Ferengi, um, which were invented in the late eighties, I believe in for Star Trek, um, were a caricature of our own fixation on profits. And in fact, the Ferengi constitution says nothing about morality. It only says about profits. The Ferengi constitution are, is called the rules of acquisition. That is their highest religious and, and philosophical doctrine. Um, and, uh, let's just say it seems like it was a little too on point. Um, so if nihilism is the problem, nihilism is the underlying problem that says nothing matters. I'm just going to look out for myself. The answer then is post nihilism. So some people like Jordan Peterson, Eugene Rose, and a few others have all said, we need to go backwards. We need to go back to traditional structures. Uh, and their hearts are in the right place, but humanity never goes backwards. In the, I mean, there might be fits and starts. There might be temporary setbacks, setbacks like, you know, we, we struck down Roe v. Wade. So that's a setback, but in the grand scheme of things, we go forwards. So rather than being an anti nihilist, rather than being a humanist, rather than trying to go backwards and force things into, you know, oh, let's just go back to the good old days. No, my recommendation is that we move forward. We move through nihilism. We embrace it. We say, yes, there is some merit here, but it is insufficient. This is what happened with modernism and postmodernism. Modernism said that there should be, that universal truths should be uh, found through science and reason and experience. But then as we became more globally aware, we realized Actually, it's really hard to establish a universal truth. Let's throw out that idea. And post postmodernism said there is no such thing as universal truth. It's all relative. Nihilism tried to say nothing matters. And that is really, one, it's really immature. Two, it's premature. And three, it's just deeply unsatisfying. Right? Like, if you if you say nothing matters, like, are you not paying attention to the fact that like life is incredibly rare. So the central tenet of post nihilism that I propose is, is that we say that all life is intrinsically valuable. And that this is not a rejection of nihilism. This is not anti nihilism. This is moving forward and it says, actually we got to the ground truth. We, 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 we questioned what does anything mean? And we exist. Like I am awake. I am a bit of matter and energy that is aware of its own existence. And when you stop to think about that, that's pretty freaking cool, right? Like just hold on to that for a minute. Why? Why is it that what separates, you know, some, some organic matter from the rest of the universe, we are extraordinarily rare. And by, by we, I mean all living things, we are rare. And that makes us really special. So if we all agree that life is pretty cool, where can we go from there? What if we say like life is cool, life is special. We are special just by virtue of existing. One of the things that I think you can, you can derive from that is that we all deserve to feel good. We didn't ask to be here. No one can ask to be born. In fact, there's antinatalism. That's a philosophical uh, disposition that says that assigns a negative value to birth. And that antinatalism is a perfectly reasonable reaction to growing up in a nihilistic world. It says, hey, you created me and now you don't care about me. Of course I don't want to be here. This is, this is stupid. But what if instead we say all life is intrinsically valuable and therefore we all deserve to feel good? And of course, I can hear the internalized nihilism speaking, not just in, in my audience, but in myself. Who said that anyone deserves anything? 
And what I mentioned earlier about the arbitrariness of beliefs, when you, when you really boil it down, all beliefs are one, personal and subjective, and everything is a belief, whether it's your belief in science or your belief in religion or whatever you believe, and it's shored up by some evidence, right? So we believe in science because of evidence. There are plenty of people that believe in various religions based on their own, their own personal evidence, right? There is social evidence, there's empirical evidence, there's scientific evidence, whatever. I'm about to go on that rant that Picard did, like, <laughs> the first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth, whether it's personal truth, historical truth, scientific truth, spiritual truth, whatever truth means to you, it is personal. It is intrinsically personal. This is something that I took from postmodernism. Yes, I agree with that, but we, because beliefs are arbitrary, we can all just say, you know what, we're done with nihilism. Let's move beyond that. Let's go to something different and more. And, uh, you know, this could be us, but we let the nihilism worms in our brain. Okay, so stepping away from religion and spirituality for a second, empirically speaking, how do we, how do we move towards a more post-nihilistic world? What does that look like? Well, if AI and automation are going to destroy 50 plus percent of jobs in the next 10 years, uh, we're going to need a grain dole. And for historical reference, for people that aren't history nerds, Rome, ancient Rome, had a grain dole when times got tough where they just gave out grain for free because nobody could afford it. But all the wealthy barons, they produced enough. And so redistribution is nothing new. Uh, nihilism made us complacent and expect dystopian outcomes. But if we change our minds, if we all change our minds, then we can agree that maybe redistribution, it's time for this idea again. It won't happen yet because we all still have that crab mentality, that, that, that fear, guilt, and shame around scarcity. So uh, another way of, of saying crab mentality is scarcity mentality, scarcity mindset. So we need to get over our scarcity mindset. And post-nihilism, the reason that I say post-nihilism is the answer, is because it changes our orientation, not just towards each other, but towards ourselves. One of the reasons that I quit my job, my day job, is because I realized I deserve to feel better than how they treated me. And I think everyone deserves to feel better. And when I, when I discovered that, it was an eye-opening. It was like a major awakening. I was like, wait, I deserve to feel better. Everyone deserves to feel better. Um, and then I was like, yeah, this is the, I, I feel like this is a universal principle. And if we all believe that everyone deserves to feel better, our orientation towards scarcity changes. I went shopping I was, when I was sick. I went to the grocery store to get soup with my fiance, and uh, there was a guy outside asking for change, and I, I don't carry cash. And I said, "Sorry, man, I don't, I don't have any cash." And I thought about it. I was like, "Wait, I got a bag full of food. Like, let me just give him some food." Um, and I, I, I walked back and I said, "Hey, man, I don't have any cash, but you want some soup?" <laughs> you know, like I was, I was actively sick, and I'm like, "I've got more than I need." Like, I think that he deserves to feel good. Just by virtue, he exists. I don't care what his history is. Sorry, I'm getting choked up. <clears throat> I don't care what someone has been through or done. If, if we're here, if we exist, we all deserve to feel good. Sorry. <clears throat> so it's about striking a balance, right? Obviously, this is a really big idea, you know, mass redistribution. Marxism and socialism isn't the answer. Um, it's too radical. I don't think that centralized ownership, that collective ownership and, and centralized control is the answer um, because, you know, the so-called experts often get it wrong. Look up the famines that happened in the Soviet Union because of the so-called experts deciding what to do with the farms. Um, so yeah, like we should be, we should be wary of centralized ownership we need to bank on the wisdom of masses, um, which which says, okay, we need we do need we need do, we bleh, bleh, we do need some level of liberty and in individual decision and also collective decision making, not collective ownership, collective decision making. Which democracy is, republics representative democracy is a method of collective decision making. Neither is libertarianism or anarchy a solution. Sorry, 
Um, we do need structure. When you've got a planet with 8 billion people on it, you absolutely need, you need power structures. Now, those power structures need to be fair. They need to be better. Now, I think we can probably all agree, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think we can agree that individual liberty is important. I like being able to decide where I'm going to work, who I'm going to live with, who I spend time with, what I do for fun, what I believe, what I think. So if we can all agree that individual liberty is, is, is good, then it's like, okay, well, we don't want any hard, hard left or hard right. We need to be you know, a little bit more reasonable, a little bit more modern, moderate, sorry. By extension, I think we can agree that property rights are important. And what I mean by that is I own my house. My house wasn't given to me by the government. I worked and I earned my house. And so like, it's a reward, right? Um, our brains are efficiency calculators and it's like, okay, well, what am I, if, if there's no reward, then why am I going to do it? Now, this is where like, okay, as much as I wish that it was, it was like this, like Star Trek, um, you know, says like, we all work to, uh, for the betterment of ourselves and mankind. To be fair, that's when I started, that's why I started my YouTube video, um, was I just wanted to get information out there. Um, but the reward is still like social validation, right? Was like, I'm doing this because I'm part of a society. So anyways, going down a tangent, point being is that property rights are important. So if individual liberty is important and property rights are important, but also fairness and equity is important, my answer is we should go for a well-regulated economy, keep it fair, with robust redistribution. That's the grain dole idea. So this idea still has to be paired with that new philosophy. Because our philosophy of scarcity mentality, our scarcity of nihilism, won't let us do that. We need a new moral framework or a new disposition towards not just each other, but towards ourselves in order to achieve this. So thank you all for watching. Be kind. It's already hard enough. Take care.